Someday it seems that all of my effort is vain. And in spite of my effort, all I've produced is more strain. My doubts and delusions, all of my hope is erased. But His grace is sufficient for every trial I face. Gives me grace sufficient for every trial I face. In this situation, He promised to stand in my place. He'll take me through every valley to stand on the mountain by grace. His grace is sufficient for every trial I face. Somehow I know He always answers on time. When the outlook seems darkest and faith is the hardest to find. Just stand still and see how the Lord to your rescue will raise. His grace is sufficient for every trial I face. He gives me grace sufficient for every trial I face. situation he promised to stand in my place he'll take you through every valley to stand on the mountain by grace his grace is sufficient for every child I face the hardest to find just stand still and see it Lord to your rescue will raise His grace is sufficient for every trial I face He gives me grace sufficient for Promise to stand in my place. He'll take you through every valley to stand on the mountain by grace. His grace is sufficient for every trial I face. Is the hardest to find. Thank you, Lord. Just stand still now, see how the Lord to your rescue will raise. His grace is sufficient for every trial I face. He gives me grace sufficient for every Promise to stand in my place. He'll take you through every valley to stand on the mountain by grace. Oh, yes. His 
His grace is sufficient for every trial I face. to what I was listening to, you would have heard what I heard. You didn't ask me, so let me tell you what I heard. I heard that his grace is sufficient for every trial you face. I don't know about you, but that's good news for me. What do you say? Wherever you're watching from, wherever around the world you're watching from, I just stop by to tell you that we spent some time talking about you that I didn't even have time to change my clothes. Hello, somebody. I said we spent some time this evening talking about you. Uh, that we didn't, I didn't have time to, to go home or to go any place near to home uh, to change my clothes. So I, I'm coming straight to you in my work clothes. So I am at work with you tonight. I wanted to know that God wants to do something special in your life. I don't have to see your face. I don't have to know your name. But God knows who you are. I don't have to know where you live. I don't have to understand the details of your struggle. But in a world like this, I didn't even tell them what to sing. But God ordained that song for your ears and for your heart. That you may know that in every trial you face, trying to make heaven your home, his grace is sufficient for every trial that you face. I don't care what your mountains look like, sir. I don't care what your valleys look like, ma'am. God brought me here to tell you that you have a decision you've been contemplating. You have been seriously weighing the issue of surrendering your life to Jesus Christ. You have been seriously struggling with that bad habit, struggling with that conflict in your mind, struggling with the truth you know to be right, struggling with God's commandments. Tonight, I just stop by just to ask God to give me enough strength just to get the word over to you. But he's got grace sufficient for every trial you face. I think right now of a young man who listened to the word on Friday night, drove through snow somewhere in the Carolinas, struggling through snow. Son, if you're listening to me, we took time out this afternoon just to pray for you. I'm so touched by the fact that, you know, the phone was ringing upstairs. It was long after we were done here. But, 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 but one of our tech team ran back up there and that's how he got your call. That's how he got your call to, to let you know that God planned it for you. Listen to me this evening. I know that it may be snowing where you are. I know you may have some difficulty finding a pastor and finding a church. The young man drove through snow and when he found the, the Adventist church that, that he could find, it was closed because the snow and stuff. 
But I'm so glad that God ordained this, that, that though it's not sowing, snowing here, we can talk from here to there. And I'm so blessed, so glad to know that you're lining up for baptism this coming weekend. So hear the preacher. Maybe you didn't get to talk to one of us. Maybe you didn't even get to type it in the chat. But you're listening to me right now. You are listening. Maybe you're just getting on. So let me, let me keep on saying it until you get your instrument. And, and let me buy you some more seconds just in case you have a friend that you didn't get to send the link to. Uh, I'm buying you a few moments. I know I'm, I'm cutting down my preaching time, but I'm buying you a few moments just so you can send that link to somebody. And if you're getting that link right now, hear me clearly. He, I don't know how long God has been talking to you. I don't know how many sermons you've listened to. I may not be God's first voice to you, but I know I could be God's last voice to you. This may not be the first time you're hearing or getting a chance to hear God's word repeat. But hear me somebody, hear me Gen Zers, hear me Gen Xers, hear me sir, this may be God's last warning message to you. Wherever you are right now, fasten your seatbelt. I have a word from God, tailor made for you. Listen to me, every night I begin the altar call by saying, if you're a backslider, don't die in that backslidden state. There is a reason I start there, and I start there because of my understanding of the preaching of Jesus. He began preaching. He said, I've come, first of all, to call the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And oh, whilst I was contemplating that statement this afternoon or this evening in, 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 in hurrying to get here, and I, and I wouldn't lie to you, I just had time to change my shirt. Are you listening to me? In, and it's a good thing they allow me a space in my office to keep a spare shirt. While I was changing that shirt, a new thought came to my mind on this issue of backsliding. It may, sometimes we think of backsliders just as those who have turned their back on Jesus, who used to walk with Jesus, but the Holy Ghost brought to my mind a new kind of backsliders hear me pastor hear me sir maybe you knew more than you are preaching right now maybe you were brought up in a church teaching you obedience to God's commandments but somehow you've backslidden from that and you have taken a job allowing you to be a pastor preaching something less than what you know to be right well God ask me to tell you it's time to come back to the Bible God asked me to tell you when the thought came to me, it blew my mind. Hear me. I don't know who you are. Maybe you were brought up by your grandmother, but you became a man and you took a job teaching some stuff that has no basis in the word of the living God. You know better. You've backslidden from what you know to be right. God asked me to tell you it's time now to pack your bags and get ready for heaven. Ah, I feel I could do the altar call and then preach afterwards. But they're up here, so let me allow them to sing that God's goodness is running after you. He woke you up this morning. I'm not asking you, I'm telling you, God woke you up this morning. I don't care how loud your alarm clock was. I don't care the guard you pay to watch your gate. God woke you up this morning. God kept you through today. The Holy Ghost brought you right now to listen to a word from God tonight. I don't know who you are, but this could be God's last voice to you. And all your life he's been faithful to you. But you've got one more chance tonight. Make the best use of it. I love you, Lord. Yes. For your mercy never fails me All my days oh, yes. Have been held kept. in your hand Held by his hand, kept in his plan the moment that I wake The devil up, would have killed you last night But God's mercy my hand, Held destruction of pain of the That's why I'll sing of the goodness of God, of God. Yes all my life, you have been God has been faithful. I don't deserve the least of His favor. All my life, you have been so But we can testify tonight. We serve a good God. Yes, 
sing it. Well, I will sing of the goodness of God. Surely His goodness is running after, running after you. Oh, you want to sing hallelujah. Your goodness is running out. That's why you're, you're not dead. That's why the action of the devil planned to take your life. All your life. So that you could surrender now and give every praise to Almighty God. God, cover me one more time in the blood that flowed from your side. Touch these sinful lips one more time for the preaching that is necessary. Let the same blood be applied to every ear that will hear the word, to every heart that shall be moved by your spirit but I ask you one favor tonight hold the devil in check and save thousands around the world as you give the wind a mighty voice it is the prayer of your sinful servant in Jesus name and let God's children say amen well you would know right now that I have to take, go straight to it. We're going straight to the 11th chapter of Revelation. And we could talk about Revelation's two weaknesses. Revelation's two weaknesses. And the Greek word that is used here for weakness in our text is the same root word from which we get the word martyr. And the, the, the ancient prophet is trying to help us understand here that, that it's not just a regular weakness here, but, 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 but the two weaknesses speaks here in, in profundity. In, 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 in the simple outline, we will find some profound stuff. I may not be able to finish in one sermon, so walk with me closely. Don't stay uh, too far apart. We go to Revelation 11. Uh, son, you started echoing just now, so you can take me back to where it was. We go to the 11th chapter of Revelation. And I'd love to hear you read with me, beginning at verse 11. That's okay. To, well, you, you, you move it up a little bit, and I'll just keep talking until you get it right. So I won't stop un, un, until you get it right. Uh, uh, if you take off the echo for me and um, get me but right where, when, when, when I'll tell you, uh, you're all, well, you're getting a little, well, let me just leave you alone anyway. Revelation chapter 11. The 11th chapter. And as you turn your Bibles there, now you can put your hand in your pocket. The 11th chapter of Revelation. And I'd like you to begin with me at the very first verse. That's Revelation 11. And we begin at verse 1. Uh, now, if you don't Leave it right there. I know you're touching something because it's changing up here. Blessed are those who obey the preacher. They shall live even one night longer. Woe unto those who disobey. A casket will be waiting for them. The 11th chapter. And the first verse. And there was given to me a reed like a rod. And the angel stood saying, Rise and measure the temple of God and the altar and them that worship therein. But the court which is without the temple, leave it out, measure it not, for it is given to the Gentiles and the holy city, and they shall tread underfoot forty and two months. I'd like you to underline the last four words. In verse 2, 40 and 2 months. Verse 3, and I will give power unto my two witnesses 
and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and three score days clothed in sackcloth. I'd like you to underline a thousand two hundred and three score days. And you can put in bracket clothed in sackcloth. These are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks standing before the God of the earth. And if any man will hurt them, fire proceedeth out of their mouth and devoureth their enemies. If any man will hurt them, he must in this manner be killed. Verse 6. These have power to shut up heaven that it rain not in the days of their prophets. In the days of their prophecy. In the days of their prophecy. And have power over waters to turn them to blood and to smite the earth with all plagues as often as they will. When they shall have finished their testimony, the beast that ascendeth out of the bottomless pit shall make war with them and shall overcome them and kill them and their dead bodies shall lie in the street of the great city which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt where also our Lord was crucified. I'd like to read verse 8 again. And their dead bodies shall lie in the street of the great city which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt where our Lord also was crucified and they of the people and kindreds and tongues and nations shall see their dead bodies three days and a half and shall not suffer their dead bodies to be put in graves verse 10 and they that dwell upon the earth shall rejoice over them and make merry and shall send gifts one to another because these two prophets tormented them that dwell on the earth and after three days and a half the spirit of life from God entereth into them and they stood upon their feet and great fear fell upon them which saw them. What an awesome 11 verses in this 11th chapter. So let me take you back to the beginning. Let me explain to you that these two witnesses are identified by their characteristic features. Most scholars in their detailed analysis have come to the conclusion that they are God's prophetic word captured in both Old and New Testament. Now let's deal with some stuff here because I wanted to understand that right in these verses are issues dealing with you. Yes, you sir. Yes, you ma'am. Fasten your seatbelt and stay with the preacher for the next 25 minutes. The Bible said there was given to me a reed like a rod saying rise and measure the temple and the altar and them that worship therein. Listen to me carefully. Our God, the God of the church, the God of the Bible is a God of order, a God of righteousness, a God of standards. I know sometimes we like to bring God down to our standard and this is a world we won't want to worship God. We like God to be made our servant. Let me say it another way. Most of the world is ungodly. Most of modern world is entrenched in bare face ungodliness. 
There's no regard for God. There's no regard for the word of God. There is no respect for the Bible. That even preachers are teaching that the Bible is just another book that you don't have to take it like it is. We want a God who is made in the likeness of who we are. We want a God who is made in the likeness of man. But I thank God tonight. I bring to you a God in whose likeness he made man. Sin has deformed us. But Christ came to transform us. And right here in this first verse, the prophecy explained to us that God will measure by the standard of these two witnesses, anyone who claimed to be his child. The issue here has to do with the worship of the living God and an opposing power. Hang with the preacher. Walk with me. It's going to get real good as we get further. Verse 2 said, but the court which is without the temple, leave it out. Don't measure it for it is given to the Gentiles and the holy city and they shall tread it underfoot 42 months. This same period is repeated a number of times in this same chapter, in the 12th chapter, in the 13th chapter, and I won't rush past those, so walk with me carefully. Revelation chapter 11 is highlighting the power of the word of the living God. The two witnesses that are described here as the two candlesticks. What do we do with candlesticks? The prophet was writing in a culture when they had no electricity. Candlesticks was used to provide light. What did David say about the word of God? Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Some interpretations of the same text refer to the two uh, witnesses as the two lampstands, the two olive branches, the two candlesticks, both the old and the new testament well some folks say preacher i don't like the old testament it's only filled with wrath well while they were singing my fingers jumped to a certain passage i put my keys there so i would miss it it's jeremiah 31 in jeremiah 31 and verse 3 the Bible said, the Lord hath appeared of old unto me, saying, I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, with loving kindness have I drawn thee. Don't let the devil tell you that there is no love in the Old Testament. The devil does not want you to hear the word of God right here in the 31st chapter you find God saying I love you with an everlasting love and if I have only a minute to explain what this means well let me take the minute and say to you in 60 seconds in it that God loves you even when you are unlovable when nobody else would bother with you when you can't even be bothered with yourself, you may be on the verge right now of wanting to commit suicide. But God says, I love you with an everlasting love. I love you when you think you are worthwhile. I love you when you know you are worthless. I love you when you think you are up. I love you when you know you are down. I love you even when you are so down that getting up is never on your mind. I love you when you are so messed up, so broken that you can't even stand to look in the mirror. Because every time you look in the mirror, you see what you don't want to see. God says, I love you with an everlasting love. I love you with an everlasting love and that's the old testament the devil would want to make you think that all that is in the old testament is the wrath of god the devil 
would like you to think that there is no love, there is no grace, there is no mercy in the Old Testament. But let me tell you, when Jesus Christ came here, he had no New Testament. When John preached, he had no New Testament. When Paul preached, he had no New Testament. Listen to me carefully. The New Testament is about the life and times of Jesus and his apostles and the disciples. The devil does not want you to get ready for the second coming of Jesus. And broken up people, sinful people, people laden with iniquity needs to know that God is love. But ah, the Old Testament balances the picture right in the first book of the Bible. We have law and grace combined together in the third chapter when God said to Adam and Eve, because you sinned, I shall have to lock you out of the garden because the law of God declares that the hear me carefully, the only way you know sin is because of the law of God. Devil doesn't want us to know that we're sinners. Devil doesn't want us to be convicted. Oh, David said the law of the Lord is perfect. The Psalm 19, converting the soul. You can't be converted until you are convicted of sin. And the same Holy Ghost that convicts you and make you feel worthless and make you feel ashamed, he will not leave you there. God loves you too much to leave you the same way he finds you. But the chapter is not done. Oh, Holy Ghost, help the preacher. Trying to pack so much into this sermon. He said in Jeremiah 31, 31, Behold, the days come, said the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel, not according to the covenant I made with their fathers when I took them by the hand and bring them out of the land of Egypt. I was a husband to them, but this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, said the Lord. I'll put my law in their inward parts. I'll write it in their hearts. This is God speaking. I'll put my law. Hear me carefully. He said, uh, when I made the first covenant, I dragged them out of Egypt, but they wouldn't obey. But God says here, I'll do better. I'll do better. In the first instance, I wrote it on stone. In the second instance, I'll allow the Holy Ghost to climb down inside of you. I'll write my law in your heart and then I'll give you grace to trust and obey. You've got to put the old and the new together. In the old, he says, I'll write it in your heart. In the new, he says, my grace is sufficient to keep you. For when you're weak, my strength is made perfect the old and the new these two witnesses together they tell you you're a sinner but together they tell you that the power of God is available to you but ah uh, I'm sorry I have to run from this but let me get back to the 11th chapter there's something here he said, and I will give power to my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand, two hundred, and three score days. Hush your fuss. Put your finger right there at the third chapter and jump with me. Jump with me over to Revelation 12. I'm going to read verse 6 for you, but to help you make the connection, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to read again Revelation 11 verse 3, then I'll read chapter 12 and verse 6, then I'll take you to 13 and verse 5, and you'll find the same statement. Hang with the preacher, walk with me. Let's go back to the 11th chapter and the third verse. And I will give power unto my two witnesses and they shall prophesy a thousand 
203 score days clothed in sackcloth. Jump over to the 12th chapter and the 6th verse. And it reads, And the woman, which is the church, fled into the wilderness where she hath a place prepared of God that they should feed her there a thousand two hundred and three score days. Jump with me to the 13th chapter and the 5th verse. Follow me carefully. Chapter 13 and verse 5 and it reads, and there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies and power was given to him to continue 42 months. Now, now in the Hebrew context, with 30 days to the amount, when you do the math, it gives you the same period of 1,203 score days a day in prophecy according to god's word means a year now watch this watch me carefully i know i'm telling you deep stuff but i'm glad only intelligent folk connect to hear the word of god hear me carefully the bible is here saying that the two witnesses the same two calling men to the love of god the same two pointing out the way of sin the same two lifting up the law of God the same thing that Psalm 19 said is the same thing that Romans 7 says the same thing that David said that the law of God is perfect is the same thing that Paul says that God's law is perfect the harmony of the old and the new the union of the old and the new constitutes God's divine revelation calling the world to come back to his will. Now hush your fuss and, and walk with me carefully. Number one, the prophecy is taking us along those days just leading up to the coming of Jesus. So it predicts here that the two witnesses would have to prophesy in sackcloth. Sackcloth gives the impression and the picture of sorrow. What is it then that would make the word of God appear this way in sorrow? What is it that would seek to threaten the very life of the church and the word of the living God? Well, I'm glad you asked. In the 12th chapter, when we look at the woman, the woman represents God's true church. I told you that. I told you also that an apostate system, uh, uh, the bridging of pagan Rome and papal Rome, oh Lord, help the preacher. When Justinian, when Emperor Justinian was abdicating Western Rome, he exalted the Bishop of Rome to be the head, not only over the church, but he may he gave him temporal power and he joined that with his religious authority. Hear the preacher, the title that Justinian gave to the Roman bishop was corrector or defender of the faith and corrector of heretics. Don't rush past that. I know I'm telling you a lot in a short time, but hear me carefully. Good things come wrapped in tight packages. So let me tell you what I told you, and then I'll tell you what I'm going to tell you. I told you that the two witnesses sets forth God's standards, his measuring rod, measuring the temple. That's the place where God's name is exalted. Measuring the worshipers. That's the people who claim to worship the Lord God. Hear me. There's no salvation in simply going to church. You and I must be measured by the word of the living God. Whatever we believe must be rooted in the Bible. Listen to me, reverend. Hear me, bishop. Hear me, priest. Hear me, prelate. Hear me, pastor. 
Jeremiah 23 and verse 1 says, Woe be unto the pastors that destroy and scatter the sheep of my pasture. But hear me, worshipers, hear me, fellow churchgoers. Jesus Christ said in John 10 and verse 27, My sheep hears my voice, and I know them, and they follow me well how do i follow him let jesus speak for himself he said in john chapter 14 and verse 15 if you love me if you go follow me if you love me keep my commandments that's a new testament command and he is speaking of the same ten he gave in the old testament hang with the preacher let me tell you what i told you and then I'll tell you what I'm going to tell you. I told you that these two witnesses are measuring the temple. The Bible sets the standards. The church did not create the Bible. God is the author of the Bible. And if you want to find a church, use the Bible. Study the Bible and then look for the church that's teaching the plain verse said the Lord God look in the Bible use it as your measuring rod anybody who claim to be a teacher measure what they say against the book of God from Genesis to Revelation anybody who claim to be leading you to heaven has mm, a mischievous spirit just i won't call his name but there was a preacher that i loved and he was he loves to do crusade just like me and so he he'd go to these cities and he would have these great crusades and and he he was doing uh the preliminary work you know uh, guiding the folk in doing the pre-work and he wanted to send a postcard back to his staff at home and he was trying to find a post office and he saw a little boy and said little boy come here can you tell me where to find the post office little boy said sir it's right there see the sign right there it's right beside you he said oh thank you thank you and he he slipped by but before he mailed his postcard he said come here son come here well, you've, you've been such a good help uh, uh, I'm going I'm going to be here in two months time for an evangelistic series and I want you to come on the opening night I want to invite you to come he said well, well sir what, what will be the series about he said I, I want to show people how to get to heaven little boy scratched it and said sir if you can't find the post office that is right beside you how are you going to help me find heaven that is so far away ah beloved anybody who's going to show you the way to heaven has got to be somebody who is rooted in the plain verse said the lord god because if the blind follow the blind then both of them shall fall in the ditch the two witnesses the bible said will come up on hard times oh uh, i i have to rush but but hear me carefully the two olive trees, the two candlesticks stand before the God of the earth. Now I find verse 5 of the 11th chapter interesting. It dances back and forth between the past and gives you an idea of the power they have in the future. Verse 5 says, if any man will hurt them, fire proceedeth out of their mouth and devour their enemies. And if any man will hurt them, he must in this manner be killed. They have power to shut up heaven that it rain not in the days of their prophecy. They have power over waters to turn them into blood and to smite the earth with all plagues as often as they will. And God pulled together in a most amazing fashion two of the earth's most astounding prophets. Who are they? The same two who when Jesus 
needed some encouragement. I needed to share some stuff with Peter, James, and John. And he took them up to the mount and was transfigured before them. Who are the two men that they say they saw? Moses and Elijah. Well, what did God say about the last days just before he comes back? He said, I'll send you Elijah the prophet. Will Elijah come back in bodily form? No, but the same type of message, the same kind of clarion call. Elijah was no sugar-coating preacher. Elijah was no wishy-washy, mamby-pamby, fraidy-fraidy. Elijah stormed into Ahab's palace. Ahab flexing his face in the face of God. Ahab married the daughter of a Jezebel's father was chief priest in the house of Baal, Ephbaal. And, and God said, uh -uh, you shouldn't join yourself. When, when Ahab married Jezebel, not only was he sealing his own fate, he was trying through devilish ideology to stamp out faith in the living God. I wish I could say this to you, but let me rush and say this right here. Elijah walked into Ahab's marble tile and said, As the Lord God liveth, there shall neither be rain nor dew until I say so, according to the word. And right here, God is reminding the church and reminding worshipers in the last days that these are the days of Elijah, that these are the days for the Elijah message, that these are the days for a straightforward call to a godless world, a straight, when Elijah spoke, the, the text, the text, the text, the text here makes reference, ah, it's too sweet to be beaten. He said, if any man will hurt them, then fire will come out of their mouth. When Moab joined in rebellion against the truth of Jerusalem, Ekron, the false god, was the one being worshipped by Moab. And so Elijah was being hunted by the Moabites and he sent 50 soldiers with a mighty captain, a trusted general. He said, bring him back. And oh, they came and they saw, wait for a moment, they saw Elijah sitting up on a rock. And he said, oh man of God, the king said to us, we must bring you back. And he said, he said, if I am a man of God, then let fire come down from heaven and consume you and your 50. And the words were not out of his mouth, but fire leaped out from the courts of glory and came down and destroyed them and their 50. Read it in 1 Kings chapter 1. Hear the preacher. God is saying right here in the 11th chapter as we come close to the end of time it is time for an Elijah kind of preaching listen to me carefully God will have a remnant you may lock them up but you can't shut them up hear me listeners your life is spared tonight because God has a straight forward call to you to come back to the Bible I see the clock it says time is up listen to me I'll finish it on Friday evening but let me pause right here the text says they'll be clothed in sackcloth he speaks of the two witnesses and he makes reference to a period of 1000 260 days in prophecy 1260 years he tells it here in the 11th chapter he repeats it in the 12th chapter he repeats it in the 13th chapter why can't you see it he speaks here of a system a religious system of apostasy that would sneak seek 
to trample God's word in the name of religion. Walk with me. I'm almost done. Walk with me. There's something here that you may not have looked at before. It was the French Revolution that brought about the end of papal supremacy that gave the beast of the 13th chapter a deadly wound but lest you start glorifying the French hear me carefully the prophet says that the two witnesses would be killed and they'd be mourning for three and a half days not buried listen to me carefully the French were no godly worshippers you think that when they took the Pope prisoner you think that when they brought an end to papal supremacy it because they were God fearing no France was steep in atheism it's atheistic concept also slaughtered God's word from 1794 to 1797 for three and a half years they banned religion they banned the Bible they banned those who would worship the Lord God and the two witnesses were slaughtered on one hand for 1260 days on the papal oppression as millions of God's children lost their lives because they would not sway apart from the Bible and on the other hand, atheistic France with its dominance would snuff out the life. But hear me carefully. Just before you get to Revelation 11 and verse 15 that talks about the coming of Jesus. He said that these two prophets would carry on their work. And the last thing you hear is God saying to them, come up higher. Come on home to glory. And after that, the next text says, and the seventh angel sounded and there were great voices in heaven saying the kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our God and of his Christ I know it's too much to, take, to tell you in 40 minutes so hear the preacher the two weaknesses in these closing days represents God's word and God's Bible believing people many tonight are in the rum bars but they are hearing this word some tonight are on the verge of suicide but they are hearing this word some tonight are prostitutes but the preacher comes by to tell you it's time to repent we're on the verge of the Elijah message in its closing days well what did Elijah do one man on the Mount of Carmel one man armed with the Word of God one man against 850 false prophets and he said to them how long will you halt between two opinions if the Lord be God then serve him if, if Baal is God then let him and, and he said oh Lord he said listen we're gonna bring out two altars and the God who answers by fire let him be God one prophet in a nation and his world overtaken by idol worship overtaken by false gods overtaken by the dominance of power against the messenger of God one man standing in the midst of a multitude of bare-faced ungodliness one man armed with nothing else but the plain thus said the Lord God one man standing in defiance against evil in triumphant certainty for his God because God said to him when you stand up and the Holy Ghost is on your side and at the end of the day at the end of the day fire came down from God drinking up 12 barrels of water and he said with the help of those who were coming back to God let not one of those false prophets escape it's a symbol of the last days it's a symbol of the closing days he said he said they will be clothed in sackcloth but you can't kill truth you can't kill the word of God Martin Luther King Jr. said truth 
pressed to earth will rise again. I know I've told you a lot, but let me say it this way. The text is clear. God's word is saying to you, these are the days of the Elijah message. These are the days for a straight forward call. These are the days when the plagues will fall on the land. When I get back on Friday night, I'll pick up the next half of our chapter. I'll tell you about the plagues of Moses and how they feature in our time. But I close with this and say to you, in sealing off this text, he made it clear. He made it clear it's a call in difficult times. It's a call that comes to you in difficult times. It's a call that comes to you in difficult times. These are the days of Elijah. These are the days for a straightforward call. And Elijah's call to a backslidden world, if the Lord be God, serve him. Elijah's call to a disobedient people, how long will you halt between two opinions? Elijah's call was a call to surrender, a call to say your life may be in danger, as his was. I don't know what song they have. I don't know who they are who's listening. I don't know who you are that's making a decision. I'm going to ask them to sing just softly, but start singing. I don't know who you are that's making a decision. When I get back on Friday evening, I'll walk you through the connectivity pieces. These two witnesses represents the Old and the New Testament. These two witnesses represent a community of people who are willing to stand up for the Word of God. willing to trust their all in the hands of God. The prophecy talks about the longest period of sustained persecution by an apostate religious system trampling on the rights of conscience trying to snap out the word of God times were when men were burnt alive they wouldn't let go of their faith in God tied at the stake they wouldn't let go in a land where multiplied millions turned their back against truth a handful a handful would follow when we get back on Friday evening you'll discover that the work of the two witnesses will culminate at the sound of the seventh trumpet what I'll tell you right now trumpet number six is gone I tell you right now, the sixth seal is gone. The issues therein are clear before our eyes. The seventh seal ushers in the kingdom of God. And the two witnesses complete their work just before he comes. You have a decision to contemplate. 
and it's time to pray. That his blood can make the vilest sinner. Our Father and our God. Thank you for the certainty that your blood can make the vilest sinner clean. Thank you, God, for the power of the two witnesses. You've declared to us the closing scenes of the work that a straightforward gospel must do. I pray tonight that you would interpret your words clearly to the hearts of those who need to know and those who desire to follow. Grant us protection on our way home tonight. Bring us back on Friday evening when we'll clarify and complete the message of the 11th chapter. Between now and then, God, decisions for surrender, decisions for baptism, decisions for eternal salvation are at stake. Let the Holy Ghost do a work that a preacher can't do for the glory of your name and the saving of our souls is our asking in Jesus' name. see you on Friday evening I'm going to ask you to in your spare time go over the 